I'm Naomi Oreskes, and I'm a professor at the University of California in San Diego. My field is history of science. I'm interested in the development of scientific knowledge, how scientists evaluate evidence and decide that something is established as a scientific fact. And in recent years, I've been focused especially on the history of climate science and its obvious importance in the world. Yes, so my co-author, Eric Conway, and I have written a book called Merchants of Doubt, and the book is an exploration of a very, very small group of scientists who have challenged the scientific evidence, not just of global warming, but a whole set of environmental issues going back to the early debates over tobacco. So as historians of science, we had worked on the history of climate science. We knew that scientists did not have a question about the reality of global warming, that expert scientists have understood since the early 1990s that the earth was heating up and that human activities were the main cause. And yet, we saw in the American public and the debate in the American media, often this was being presented as a very contested scientific question, a big scientific debate. And we knew that that was wrong. We knew it wasn't an accurate reflection of what was actually happening in the scientific community. So we wanted to better understand why the media were presenting it this way. And we stumbled upon the work of a this group of scientists, this small group of scientists, we started researching it and ended up writing a book about how they had in fact been involved in systematic campaigns to challenge scientific evidence by creating doubt, emphasizing uncertainty in order to prevent government action on these very important environmental issues. So what we found was that this small group of people were highly influential, and it had to do with two things. One is that they were very distinguished scientists. They weren't climate scientists. They were distinguished physicists who had worked in the US weapons programs, weapons and rocketry programs during the Cold War. And so through their work on the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, the weather satellite service, and other important Cold War science projects, they had risen to very high levels in American science. They knew admirals, generals, senators, and even the President of the United States. Uh, several of them were quite close with President George H.W. Bush. So they had access to power on a very, very high level, and they were very smart people. So this combination of access to power, prestige, and intelligence made them seem like very credible sources on these questions. Right. Well, we wrote the book partly because we thought, as you say, obscurantism is a very good word to describe it. We thought that it really had had an impact because opinion polls consistently showed that the American people were quite confused about global warming. And in particular, about half the American people don't think global warming is happening, or if it is happening, that they just think it's natural variability, which we know that it's not. Or they think that scientists are still arguing the point. And that was the thing that really motivated me to get engaged in this. When there was a Gallup, uh, Yale University and Gallup polling organization did a poll in 2007 in which fully half of the American people thought that scientists were still arguing about it. And I thought that was so interesting because it showed that these campaigns had been effective, that they had given the impression that there was a big scientific debate. And of course, if you're a citizen and you think that scientists are still arguing that the science is unsettled, then it's completely rational to say, well, if the science isn't settled, then obviously it would be too soon to have a carbon tax or a cap and trade system or any other intervention. So it's a very, very effective strategy for preventing action to convince people that we don't really know what's going on and we need to do more research. So we show in the book that this has been part of a very long pattern that goes back to the 1950s. And in the book we show through historical research, through documents, that the strategy was actually invented by the tobacco industry who used it to challenge the scientific evidence of the harms of tobacco in the 1950s. So in 1953, the tobacco industry made a conscious choice, a deliberate choice, which is documented in the historical records, to hire a public relations firm, Hill and Knowlton, to help them challenge the scientific evidence of the harms of tobacco. And in the book, we show how this strategy was developed in the 1960s and 70s, and then in the 1980s, how it was transferred to fight the scientific evidence, first of acid rain, then of the ozone hole, and then global warming. And we also show in the book how it, not only is the strategy the same, but the people are the same too. The exact same people were involved in all of these different debates. And that for us was really crucial because it made us realize 
this was not a principled scientific debate. You know, this is not just a group of scientists in an expert community having an argument about how to interpret the data. This is a systematic political strategy. So in the book, we focus on a set of issues that this particular group of people were engaged in. And as I said, they're all kind of earth and environmental issues, acid rain, global warming, the ozone hole. But there are other people who have now used the same strategy in other areas, such as the harms of chemicals. So there's a, a kind of companion book to our book, a book called Doubt is Their Product by David Michaels, who's now, um, I think he's the Under Secretary of Health, what, Health and Human Services, I think, for um, Occupational Health, or, or no, I've forgotten his title. Anyway, you can edit this out. Yeah. David Michaels, um, who's an epidemiologist who served in the Department of Energy in the Clinton administration and is now serving again in the Obama administration, wrote a book about how these same tactics were used in the chemical industry to challenge the scientific evidence of the harms of chemicals like benzene. I have been threatened, yes, and in fact, it's interesting, many of the people who work on these issues have been threatened. Many climate scientists have been threatened. So yes, I've received hate email. I've had people complain to my university and try to get me fired from my job. There's a lot at stake, and it's political, it's social, it's economic, and it's psychological, because it also has to do with how we understand our own society and how we understand our own democracy. And I think it's quite threatening for ordinary citizens to realize that we've been duped, that we've been misled, and that what we think are honest debates are actually not honest debates, that this is a public relations campaign whose intention is to deceive us. And that's a very hard thing to accept. Nobody likes to admit that they've been duped. But I think in the book we show pretty clearly that we've, we've all been victims of this disinformation campaign. Well, I do like to think of myself as a bit of a combination. I have scientific training in earth science, but also professional training as a historian of science. But I guess ultimately I think of myself as a historian and a humanist, because what I'm really trying to do is to bring the human dimension to these scientific discussions and to show how scientists are people, and as people, they go through a process in order to establish scientific knowledge. And that process is messy, it's complicated, it involves things that are confusing, it occasionally involves bad behavior. Um, all of that is part of normal scientific practice. And one of the important parts of the story is how the normal human frailties of scientists get exploited by these people. So if you want to generate doubt about a scientific result, one of the things you can do is to try to create doubt about the scientist. And we saw that this past year with this theft of emails from the Climate Research Unit in East Anglia. Um, when I saw those emails, I felt that I knew immediately what was going on, that this was a group of scientists who have been systematically harassed for 20 years, who are frustrated by the fact that they've been harassed. They've been the target of really sort of nuisance FOIA requests that are just designed to prevent them from getting their work done. And in their frustration, a couple of them, you know, expressed frustration to colleagues who they thought they could trust in a context that they thought was private, well, who among us in our frustration hasn't occasionally said something that we wouldn't repeat in public, but that got totally taken out of context, put on the internet, and made to seem, made to assert that the scientists had done something wrong. But of course, what we know now is the scientists did nothing wrong. They had a few bad thoughts that they never acted upon. There's no evidence that any of those um, thoughts were ever acted upon. Um, and, uh, and in, in a way, it's not really their fault, right? They have been victims of harassment. But you know, to me as a historian, this is normal. This is just scientists being human beings. But for people who have a, a kind of falsely idealized view of science, it can be used to imply that you know, something nefarious had taken place. I would say that global warming is real that scientists have known, scientists have predicted that global warming would happen since the 1950s. They've known that global warming was happening since the 1990s, so it's been more than 20 years now since we've known that this is true. This is why George, our President George H.W. Bush signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, but we've done nothing about it for 20 years, in part because we have been the victims of a misinformation campaign. So I think it's really important for the American people to understand the science is clear, we know that these changes are really taking place in the globe, and the question now is what to do about it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.